Hi everyone. Uh, hello from quarantine. Uh, the family and I are doing well. Uh, thanks for all your care. Now for today's passage. I wonder what happened if you went out on the street uh, and you started asking people, do you think the world will end? Or if you asked people, do you think the world has a use by today? What do you think they'd say? All of us will die one day, is it the same for our world? What would you say? Well, no matter what you'd answer, we all mostly live like life's going to go on forever, don't we? I mean, you don't go out and buy yourself a nice 2022 diary and you think to yourself, mm, do I get to use all the dates in this diary? No, we all kind of expect to be back here the same time next year doing the same sort of things, don't we? But if you're old enough, you might remember the Y2K bug. Do you remember that? Back in the year 2000, we are all worried that uh, the Y2K bug, all the computers would give up in the year 2000 and we'd go into some kind of uh, apocalypse. Or if you're older still, you might remember the Cold War, the threat of nuclear annihilation. And we were worried that our paranoid neighbours in the Northern Hemisphere would blow each other up and take us with them. See, we have been thinking about the end of the world for a while, haven't we? But thinking about the end of the world was common in Jesus' day as well. But it wasn't the Y2K bug, it was God. It was God who's going to bring an end to this world as he brought in his new kingdom. And the question they were asking was when and how? How would God start this new perfect world? And this is uh, what the Pharisees are quizzing Jesus about today in our passage. They're asking him, well, when will God's kingdom come? Well, when's he going to bring in this new world? Jesus tells us and them about the end of the world, and he tells them that it all centers around the Son of Man. That's Jesus' special title for himself. He is the King of God's kingdom. And so today we'll have three points. First, the new world has already begun. Now, second point, this old world will end. Jesus assures, he, he turns his disciples and he assures us and them that this old world will end. And the third point, living between two worlds. Now, let me encourage you, uh, keep your Bible open. If you're a new Christian or an old one, some of what Jesus is saying today is tricky to understand. But Jesus wants you to understand and the Holy Spirit will help. So let's pray. Lord Jesus, help us to hear your words today. May we meet you, Son of Man, in your words. So may we be ready to meet you when you return. Your people are listening. Please speak. Amen. Our first point, the new world has begun, but you might not notice it. Verses 20 and 21. Now imagine that you met a celebrity that you didn't realise they were one. I heard a story once about a guy who went to a My Chemical Romance rock band concert. Anyone here today a fan of My Chemical Romance? No? No one? Well, uh, this guy wasn't really a fan either. Uh, his friends had dragged him along and he was at the merchandise tent and he struck up a conversation with someone oh, he thought worked in the tent. Anyway, he admitted to the shop assistant that he didn't really like the band anyway. But the guy said, oh well, here's some signed posters. So he walks out of the tent and he opens up the posters and he finds the shop assistant was actually a member of the band. How embarrassing. And the Pharisees do something similar here. They're asking Jesus in verse 20, well, when will God, the King of God come? But standing right in front of them was the King of God's kingdom. The kingdom was God, for God was in the midst of you, verse 21. See, God's new kingdom was breaking into the old world and leading the charge was the king of God's kingdom, Jesus. But Jesus explains it's not like a normal kingdom. No wonder the Pharisees missed it. In verse 21, Jesus says, you can't point to the borders of the walls and say, over there it is. That's, that's where the kingdom of God is. No, the kingdom is invisible. You might not notice it. And the Pharisees did miss it. The Pharisees missed what Jesus has been saying the whole time. The kingdom of God is near. The kingdom of God is near. And Jesus wasn't just talking about this new world. He was demonstrating. See, Jesus is showing what God's perfect new world will be, look like. As he heals people, as people are made whole, as he brings in the outsider, as he casts out evil, 
See, all these are things that we long for, and Jesus is giving a taster of what God's perfect world will be like. As Christians, we are God's people. In God's place, under God's rule, we're just waiting for the perfect place. And this new world is God's place. But the kingdom of God doesn't have a postcode. We've tasted this new world, this new kingdom, here today as we gather as Christians. We're like a little outpost, an embassy of this new and perfect world. I think uh, C.S. Lewis said it well when he said, If I find in myself desires, which nothing in this world can satisfy, but the only logical explanation is that I was made for another world. Friends, we must long for this new world we have already tasted. God's new world is, is breaking in and it's already begun in us. But for us to enter fully into God's perfect world, it will mean the end of this world. And our next point, our second point, this old world will end and you won't miss it. Verses 22 to 25. Jesus changes tack in verse 22 and he speaks not to the Pharisees but to the disciples and to us. Jesus gives us the inside scoop and warns us that he's coming back to end this world. Now, uh, I'm sure you really realise this, but uh, it's the end of March. Easter's not far away. The year's going fast, isn't it? And Christmas can really seem like a long time ago, doesn't it? But at Christmas, what do we celebrate? At Christmas, we celebrate Jesus' birth. Jesus is coming to earth. And his first visit to earth, uh, it was surprising, wasn't it? Jesus came humbly as a baby. So humbly, many people didn't even recognise him as king. But in our passage, Jesus warns us that he will come to earth a second time. But when he comes, he will be coming in glory, riding on the clouds of heaven. No one will miss him when he comes the second time. When Jesus comes, he will call this world to a close. He will call cut on this world. And there's only one thing left for him on his to-do list. Take a look at verse 25. But the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by this generation. But that's the cross. That's what Jesus is talking about. We live this side of the cross. The next thing Jesus is going to do is come again and bring this world to a close. The cross is a little bit like, you know, the display on the train that says, next stop, Roma Street. Jesus' return is the next stop for this world, and it's the end of the line for this world. And Jesus wants his disciples and us to know that when he returns to end this world, you won't miss it. Uh, now, why you won't miss it, I'm doing a little bit of a cheeky wordplay here, because you won't miss it in two ways. Firstly, you won't miss it when Jesus becomes back, because it will be obvious. No one will miss it when Jesus returns. Look what he says in verse 24. When Jesus returns, it will be like a huge flash of lightning lighting up the sky. You know the kind of lighting where it can be pitch black at night and then the lightning lights up the sky and for a moment you can see everything. So too with Jesus. No one will miss it when he comes back, Christian or non-Christian, everyone will see. So we don't want to listen to people who say Jesus has already come back. In fact, Jesus warns us in verse 23, people will say, here he is or there he is. You know, uh, there's actually a cult doing that right now at the University of Sydney, where I used to live in Sydney. The University of Sydney is right across the road, and there's a cult there telling students that Jesus has come back, and that their leader uh, is Jesus who's returned, and he's living in South Korea, apparently. And so apparently they were telling them, you should give us all your money, because no, 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 friends. Don't listen to anyone who says Jesus has already come back. When Jesus comes back, you won't miss it. Secondly, what do I mean by you won't miss it? Is that if you're a Christian here today, you're a citizen of the next world, and you won't miss this world. Do you see the surprising scene that Jesus says to his disciples in verse 22? The time is coming when you will longer see one of the days of the Son of Man, but you will not see it. This is true for Jesus' disciples. He'd suffer much persecution, but it's also true for us. There are many things we won't miss about this world. The pain of physical aging, the hurt of relationships, 
for persecution in this world because we are citizens of the next world. While this world is good, it's, it's marred by sin. And the next world, our world, that Jesus will bring, our world will be perfect. But what do we do in the meantime? How do we live while we're waiting for the next world? Our next point, living and praying in between two worlds. Uh, so we've heard that Jesus is bringing God's new world, new, perfect world with no sin, and this old world is passing away. But what can we do as Christians? This perfect world is our true home, our destiny. But here we are, living in the middle of two worlds. a bit like the overlap in a Venn diagram. You know those diagrams with the two circles in the overlap? How do we live here between two worlds? Well, don't worry, Jesus prepares his disciples and us for how we are to wait. And not to look back, instead we're to look forward. Jesus says, don't get distracted. It'll look like any other day, he says in verse 26 to 30. People will be going to work, they'll be sitting in their cars, they'll be worrying about what to have for dinner. The day when Jesus comes back will be like a normal day, a nothing day. It could be this week, in fact. The other thing Jesus says is, is don't long for the possessions of this world. You can't take them with you. You're not going to run down into your house and grab your, I don't know, jewellery, computer, tools. Whatever it is that you'd be tempted to bring with us, we can't. And the really key verse here is verse 33. Verse 33, whoever tries to keep their life will lose it. Whoever loses their life will preserve it. We mustn't try desperately to keep our lives in this old world. Because if your whole life, your whole self is invested in this world, then this world's coming to an end. Or, or look at verse 34. There will be a separation on that day when Jesus comes. For the Christians, who are the people of the new and perfect world, who will finally come home. But for the people of this world, well, they must face justice. Because the sad truth is that none of us deserve this new and perfect world. Not me, not you. That's why in verse 25, Jesus says, we must suffer on the cross first. Take our punishment, our judgment, so that we can have his reward, this new and perfect world. Because of the cross, we can now look forward to this new world, and we live between these two worlds, by looking forward to the next. And you know, people are always looking forward to the next thing, aren't they? I, I don't know about you, but when I was a small child, you always looked forward to going to school. Then you spend around 12 years in school or so looking forward to finishing school. Then you spend the next 30 years or so looking forward to finishing work and retiring. And then you retire and you've got, what, 10, 20 years? Well, what do you look forward to after retirement? Well, if you're not a Christian, then that's it. That's all you've got, retirement. As close to heaven as you'll ever get. So that's why people live their whole lives for their retirement, for those 10, 20 good years. But we can look forward to not a couple of years of retirement. No, we can look forward to an eternity of perfection. So while the world skimps and saves and they work hard long for their retirement, we skimp and save and work hard not only for a couple of years of retirement, but for an eternity. At every stage of the Christian life, wherever you are, school, work, retirement, the next thing that we look forward to is Jesus' return. But what about for the non-Christian? The disciples ask in verse 37, where will they go? And Jesus' answer, it's a little bit cryptic. Where there is a dead body, there the vultures will gather. But well, what most likely is being said here is this is a bit of a saying back then, a bit of a proverb. And it's meaning to be kind of obvious. It means that it's kind of obvious where they'll go. It's like if there's a body in a desert, you can always tell because you can see the vultures circling overhead. It's obvious you know where the body is. And so for all who have not trusted in Jesus, They'll go to God's perfect judgment. And if that's you, 
If you've never asked Jesus to take your sin at the cross, today is the day. Don't delay. Let me encourage you. Don't put this off. If there are questions that you have about Jesus and the gospel, that's good. Find answers. Ask them. Don't put this off. But then, what do we do with this strange parable in chapter 18? Can we look at chapter 18? Why does Jesus talk about a widow who has to pester an unjust judge into just doing his job and giving her some justice? And Jesus is saying, look, even this bad judge in verse 18, he'll eventually give justice. How much more will God make sure his people get justice? Yes, we can look forward to our eternal retirement, but we can also look forward to perfect justice. You see, for some people sitting here today, you've been wrong terribly. And for whatever reason, in this perfect world, you may never see justice. You may never get your day in court. You may never set the record straight. And we cry out to God, like that widow, where is the justice? Just like the early disciples, they faced terrible injustice, didn't they? You know, if it didn't rain back in those days, they blamed the Christians and they killed them. And like many of our brothers and sisters today in North Korea or Syria, they cry out for justice. They look forward to Jesus' return. And we should cry out to God with them. I mean, this is the year of prayer after all, isn't it? What does Jesus say in chapter 18, verse 1? Jesus told them this parable to show them that they should always pray and not give up. Why? Because God is the exact opposite of that unjust judge. He hears and he cares. So let's not give up praying to give God. Okay, friends, let me leave you with this last illustration. Uh, I want you to imagine two people uh, and they're sitting on a train. But both of these people, they need to get off at the next stop. Okay, the first man on this train, he's distracted. Uh, he's so distracted, it looks like he might miss his stop. Uh, he's reading the newspaper, he might be looking at his phone, he's falling asleep and his stop is getting closer and closer and closer, but it doesn't look like he's ready for it. Friends, let's not be distracted by this world that's long for the next. Then there's the second person on the train. Uh, he also needs to get off the next stop. But this time it's a child. It's a boy and he has a brand new ball. Or maybe it was a birthday present. And he hasn't had a chance to use it yet. And the next stop he's getting off to go to the park and play with his new boy. Ball. And boy, this boy is excited. He's fidgeting. He's looking around the window. He's asking his friend, his parents, are we there yet? Are we there yet? He doesn't want to spend his whole life on this train. He wants to go to the park. Friends. Let's be like that child, excited and longing for the new world. And in, in the same way, this old world will feel like a stuffy old train compared to the sunlight and the fresh of the park, like our new world. We can be like this excited child. Because the truth is, Jesus might come back this week, Monday, Tuesday. Who knows? And if you're a Christian, that will fill you with eager anticipation. If you're not a Christian, then let me encourage you. What's stopping you from becoming a Christian? If you have questions, doubts, whatever it is, investigate them. Ask people you trust. It might be the most important thing you ever do. Let me pray. Dear Jesus, great Son of Man, we thank you when you first visited our world and came and died on the cross to save. Thank you that one day soon we'll be coming back to our world to end all the wrongs, to make everything right, bring us your children to a new and perfect world. Help us to wait with eager anticipation, not looking to this world, but looking to you and We ask all this for your Amen.